but uh, I don't think it turned out as they planned. David wanted to take her to the Yeah, right. I think he had a reservation for them. Did he want to take but Stephen but too? But yeah, yeah, but but Steve and Katya did not communicate, so mm. Steve did not get Katya. Hey, we want to turn this on there too, right? This little the frown. Mm. Ah, here it is. There be light and there is light. Okay, let's start. This is our, what is it, the third one? The discourse, I think we have our movie, we want to could finish up that thing. Here is your grading sheet and you are all A++. It must be the fourth one now. Yes. Fourth discourse, right? Very good. You have to register this. Okay, so, um, doesn't did we get another book by Harness there? Did we get another one? Or yeah, it's I was supposed to be in today, just respect. Okay, wait, wait. Something. okay, we're still waiting for one, right? Yeah? One more should be on its way. Okay, I think what we have is um, Civilizing Achievements is the name of our fourth discourse. Um, there's no testing today. We'll discuss that next week, what we want to do. We suggested already, you know, that you uh, do something, write something, a small thing on your background reading, which would be the manifesto, or one of you has the other one there, right? The other yeah. book there. That's yeah, so that would be one thing. Uh, and the other one is to choose one of these theories, that means either Habermas or Hannes, and uh, to a note paper on this. Uh, and then we had a third thing that I um, it gives you some questions. You can answer the questions instead of writing these papers. So that, that was the alternative. And we'll see next week what we do. Okay, now um, Dustin got books here of English uh, translations of Hanif. So we let this go around here. The pathologies of reason, that's the theme of our course, right? But then there is also, and we could have called it the same way, the pathologies of individual freedom, Hegel's social theory, that is another one, then reification, that is also Hegelian and a Marxian concept, new book and old ideas, and uh, then we have the critique of, th these are all in your uh, depth study, the critique of power, that is on Foucault, and then we have the struggle of recognition, and we mentioned that the moral grammar of social conflicts. And then this one is here, that is on Habermas. Uh, really, it's on the whole Frankfurt School, key writings by the major thinkers there. That was brought out by Mendieta, um, who is a professor in the University of New York, I think. And he did one thing on Habermas, uh, and the other one is on the whole Frankfurt School. So that's our back. There's a lot of stuff around. Uh, what I want to say about the, when I looked into those books there, can we just pull that uh, curtain there in the back? That they cannot look into it here, the FBI and the <laughs> CIA. And there's one hole for the FBI and one for the CIA. We shut it up there. <laughs> they were sitting here, you know, the guys there for, in the 70s, they waited for their cars for weeks out there. <laughs> okay, what I want to say is um, the uh, something which uh, Hannes, says in these books there. Uh, I think we mentioned already that the background of the Frankfurt School is Kant. K-A-N-T, Emmanuel Kant. And then also, of course, Hegel, we mentioned him. And there, of course, also Marx and Freud, and then also Nietzsche plays an important role. So these are the ancestors of the school. Kant talked about critical philosophy, and that is where this name comes from. Sometimes people think, or they thought in the beginning that Horkheimer called that thing critical theory in order to hide Marxism, because it was pre-fascist uh, liberal Germany, and that was a bad name, and so, but I don't think uh, they were hiding it. I think it's rather in the tradition, the Kantian tradition, in particular of critical philosophy, they called it critical theory of society instead. But the interesting thing is that Hannes tries, like Habermas, to build a bridge between continental, and uh, Dustin knows that from the philosophy 
philosophy departments on continental philosophy, and then American or Anglo-American philosophy. And so Habermas has tried his best to build a bridge, and Hannes has done that too. He is here a lot and gives talks all over the place, that's right. And the question is, you know, why does it not work? I mean, they really, the, the other, the older guys, so Horkheimer, Adorno, and Marcuse, and Fromm, I mean, Fromm was very good in, um, in, in building bridges somehow, but they didn't think of him of the Frankfurt School anymore. And Marcuse had horrible conflicts, of course, with Reagan, you know, he discussed publicly, he shouted at Reagan from Paris, he gave speech in Paris against Reagan, and then Marcuse died and Reagan won, so, <coughs> but the, uh, the older ones, uh, were not so active in building the bridge between the two, but Habermas and Hannes are doing it. And so the question is, why is it so difficult? So there I looked at the book today, which is John Searle. Searle is a positive scholar. He was here, he visited the philosophy department, and I talked with him. And he wrote this little book, The, Re the Rediscovery of the Spirit the rediscovery of the spirit. And let's have just a tiny little discussion on that word spirit. Because it seems that this is why American philosophy and sociology and psychology and so on are opposed to the continental one and so on. So the, uh, what he tries here, he tries to discover spirit and then he talks about consciousness. So it's the attempt to rediscover consciousness. And then he, uh, so there are lots of chapters on this. And then when you look here in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, the books which he uses, and you look, for instance, under K, you don't find, yes, there is, I have to say name, Richard, uh, there is Kant here. So he has two quotes of Kant. When we look at uh, age there, uh, he has nothing about Hegel, and has two things of Kant, and then of course nothing of the Frankfurt School, no Adorno, no Habermas, no Horkheimer, and so So um, there you see the split here incarnated, in a certain sense, what the problem is. So uh, Hannes thinks um, particularly the philosophy of right of Hegel. The philosophy of right um, is about the whole social world. Uh, it has not been accepted here. People do not write about it. They don't discuss about it. And uh, I took one part out of it, and that was the family. So I have a book on Hegel's uh, concept of the family. <laughs> and, uh, but nobody followed that here. They followed it in Belgium. So, uh, 100 years, 150 years after the death of Hegel, nobody had ever written about Hegel's concept of the family. Then, 20 years after I had done it, somebody in Belgium did something on it. But nobody in the States did, on, did anything on it. So, there is some kind of a disruption of the discourse. So, Horner thinks that people think that the book, this political philosophy of Hegel, or political sociology, that this is not democratic. Um, because um, Hegel does not believe in the absolute of the subjective freedom. So subjective freedom and therefore democracy. So that Hegel is somewhat not for democracy. And there's other things that Hegel was the court philosopher, so that he is a monarchist, or Hello, that he no emphasizes the Please state leave. too much, Please that he thinks the state is God on earth, or something like that. So all of this is an accumulation of, uh, but Hannes takes only one thing, so that Hegel would not support this absolute uh, subjective freedom that you can do what you want to, and uh, that they connect with democracy. Now, I think if we look and we want to be honest to both sides and we want to be serious, you know, about the argumentation on one side, it is true 
that in his philosophy of right, uh, he, for instance, thinks that liberalism is obsolete. He writes that that liberalism is obsolete uh, around the first Great Depression, 1827. And in this depression, you know, thousands of people in England and in France and so on uh, starved to death. There was no social legislation yet. It was simply the freedom of everybody to do what they want to. One is stronger and throws down the weaker ones, and the capitalists are the stronger ones. So it was liberal capitalism, not big corporations yet, but like Ford or, uh, and, and here. So, but it was, you know, smaller corporations still. But uh, these guys were on top, and they subordinated the masses of the workers under them. Everybody was free, and uh, those who used their freedom most powerfully, they were on top, and the others were at the bottom. And uh, now there was not only <coughs> that Hegel saw it, he read the newspapers, particularly British newspapers, all day long, so that he was horrified, you know, that whole families uh, starving to death in the streets of London and so on. But also that this freedom there of the individual without social obligations, that they accumulated an inventory and uh, invested in that inventory, and they didn't stop when the inventory got in against the ceiling. That means there was no planning. The, these individual capitalists didn't plan. They produced and produced and produced, like uh, I saw a movie yesterday on, uh, on a documentary on Henry Ford, you know. Henry Ford had that thugs in the factories, you know, who beat up people, who boxed them, who beat them with instruments and so on. Uh, so that they would work and so on. It was, he was not only a friend of Hitler, it was absolutely fascist how he behaved and so on. So, nevertheless, this, um, the, uh, uh, I think Hegel was bothered, first of all, by that liberalism was unable to uh, protect the people, you know, they're starving in the streets, and that was changed later on by social legislation. And then also that that principle of subjective freedom meant that the capitalist, you know, didn't have to plan in a collective way. Uh, he maybe planned his own production there, but he went on producing, producing when the market was filled up, and then it took 12 years or whatever until the inventory was slowly consumed, and then, of course, the business cycle was over and started again. So even, uh, uh, you know, the, the Theodore Roosevelt, uh, look back on hundred years of this of this business cycle again and again and again, and even he, after the rebellion of Lower Manhattan against Upper Manhattan, the slum lords and so on, he thought there should be federal intervention in the market. One could not leave everything to the market, and uh, also uh, <coughs> that he wanted to have national health insurance at that time, which even Obamacare does not completely yet, but it's a great progress. But it does not settle it all the way because they were saying we will still have 10 million people who have no health insurance. So, so therefore, this individualism, this atomism, I think we said already that liberalism is an atomistic theory. <laughs> and there is a strange thing to it. Um, you know that Einstein thought that God does not gamble. <laughs> the God does not gamble meant that the atoms, the discrete little entities, that they all moved in a forced way, that they were not free. But Heisenberg and my friend Ivan Zupek, they thought that God gambled, and that therefore um, the individual atom was really had some beginning of individual freedom already, and could move in uh, arbitrary ways. And uh, the, um, uh, the friend, my friend uh, Ivan Zupek never joined the Communist Party, because that was the opposite, community, solidarity, and so on, not atomic thing, uh, you know. So, um, but uh, Ivan Subek um, uh, uh, tried to use physics, quantum physics, as a basis to support liberalism in a socialistic state. So, and they made him into the president of the University of Zagreb anyway, because he was such a great quantum physicist and they wanted him finally to build the atomic bomb for Tito, and uh, he refused, Ivan Zubek refused, and he uh, afterwards did not even study quantum physics anymore. But when I had discussions with him, his critique of against socialism was, look already in the atomic structure, uh, physics discovers that the atoms are free, and therefore every individual 
should be free. And the practical thing was, practical sociological thing was, that he wanted that the Yugoslav workers, who made a lot of money in Germany, could come home and invest that money in a small business, like bakery, restaurant, and so on and so on. And Tito uh, refused it. I know we were sitting on the, new, uh, the radio and tried to listen to what Tito and the politicians would say, and uh, he didn't come through with it. Tito refused it. He said, if you let those little atoms, you know, build their restaurants and so on, soon these, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you have a small bourgeoisie, middle bourgeoisie, an upper bourgeoisie, and, and then you have the old stuff again. So therefore he refused it. But um, Ivan Supek, as a quantum physicist, made these God gambles into a basis to defend liberalism. Um, but sure not in a totally absolutist way. He knew that community and all that was necessary, but um, but to a large extent uh, they were pretty. And his brother Rudi Supek was on the other side. He was on the socialistic side. So we have an antagonism in modern society. At the beginning of modernity, the individual emancipates itself from the collective, from the family, from the state, from the church. The Reformation has something to do with that. Um, liberalism was Protestant originally, and Protestantism is un it's atomistic from its very start. It is nominalistic. So um, the universals are missing. The universals are only in our head. So nominalism prepares in the head this type of individualism. And for Martin Luther, that broke through in the following way. <laughs> he had this, this conscience, this which bothered him all the time, this conscience which th told him that he was a sinner. And he once himself before the altar in Wittenberg and said, it's, me, it's not me, it's not me, I'm not Satan, and so on. So he had these horrible temptations which many saints had with him, and so he had uh, the head of the order of the Augustinian Aramites was Father Staupitz, and Father Staupitz was his uh, was his confessor, and so he would go to him and would confess, and uh, then Staupitz would say, "Your sins are forgiven, Martin. You don't have to worry anymore." So there was the idea of the of the thesaurus of the uh, um, treasure of grace which the church had because Christ had died and every individual put par would participate in this collective treasure of grace and so um, it's told him you don't have to worry and so on. but Martin had this thing he wanted to feel and to experience in himself as this individual that he had really been forgiven or that he was justified so the whole transformation was about the justification process, and um, but the individualistic element ca came in. It's not the community of the church through which you get this, but he wanted to have it as an individual. So this is where liberalism starts in the individualism in the faith community. Uh, the individual, it's not enough simply to be a member of the church but the individual wants to be an individual. So <laughs> that is, uh, then later on liberalism was um, was secularized, and uh, so it, uh, today one cannot recognize any, any uh, uh, religious elements anymore, but libertarians like Ayn Rand you write about there, that comes, it's totally secular with her and her novels and so on, but it has uh, pushed to an extreme. So, um, so that is one argument uh, which um, uh, Hannes thinks why Hegel cannot be accepted here because he does not uh, uh, support the American liberalism uh, certainly not the neoliberalism which is more radically atomistic but even the socially modified Roosevelt liberalism is not socially modified enough so that is the issue. So um, we have the Middle Ages. We go out of the Middle Ages instead of Aristotelian universalism or Platonic and so on. We with Ockham, Wilhelm of Ockham is the one who introduces uh, this nominalism and that Luther then becomes a nominalist. 
So he's not any longer Aristotelian, not any longer Platonic, but he reads the Bible and he reads in a nominalistic way. Let me explain that a little bit more what this nominalism means there. When you have Plato, Plato would say the universals, that means justice, love, and so on and so on, these universals are in heaven. They are somehow above, and what you see here, the idea of the tree is up there, and the real tree, which stands out there in the garden, is just the shadow of this real tree. He has this story of the cave there, and people look at the wall, and they see a tree on the wall, but then somebody turns their heads around, and they find out that there's only shadow there, that the real tree is out there, and that the real light is the sun behind the tree. That is what's really real. So, for Plato, the universals were uh, anterem, as it is called. It was before things. There was an idea of the tree which was before the tree in the heaven of spirit. And then comes Aristotle, his student, and he takes this idea out of heaven and puts it down into on earth. So, the idea is now in the real tree out there, as the goal tendency in the tree, how far it should go, what it consumes, uh, how the fruits come out, and so on. That is all regulated by this idea, which is now not above anymore, but it is in the things themselves. And so the Islamic uh, scholars were right away Aristotelians, and they had that more realistic view, and they threatened the whole Christianity there in Paris with this Aristotelian uh, uh, interpretation, and Thomas of Aquinas then imitated them and took Aristotelianism and imitated uh, and, and interpreted the Bible in Aristotelian terms. That went from 1200 on to 1400, 1500, and um, he rescued Christianity that way. And then came the third step, nominalism. That means these ideas of tree or justice or state or whatever, these ideas are only names, nominalism. They're only names in our head. And we apply them to these things outside. But the, the notion of things, the nature of things, how they really are, cannot be seen anymore. And that leads then to Kant, the Protestant, the Reformation, the Hellenization, then to the bourgeois revolution, Socialist revolution, Freudian revolution, and to the multiculturalism today, the dehellenization. And the Pope has a frontal attack against all that in order to defend the Church Fathers, and so on, if they are Platonic or Aristotelian and the Middle Ages. So that is the big struggle. And uh, it makes a difference, you know, if you look at things nominalistically, if you look at them Platonically, if you look at them Aristotelian, Aristotelian way. So there is this thing. Uh, universale anterem, the universals, the idea is before the thing, Plato, then universale in re, the idea is in the thing, Aristotle, and universale postrem, the, 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 the universal comes after the thing, it is only in our consciousness, and the American civilization is a nominalistic civilization more than the Europeans ever were. And out of nominalism comes then the, the, the positivism and naturalism and so on. And that is our civilization. That is our culture. <laughs> okay, now, so that is one attack. So when I, you know, write an article about Hegel or whatever, I cannot expect that it will have resonance in a civilization which thinks that the individual can fundamentally do whatever the individual wants to do. Now that is not really our position, you know, because in a certain sense we also know that this is limited. Uh, in the military, you know, the individual may very well be broken in order to get a cope spirit, you know, uh, and a fighting <coughs> spirit and so on. And so the same thing maybe in a corporation. You know, whatever the great dreams of Henry Ford was, the older he became the more authoritarian he became against his son, whom he drove into suicide there. Um, there was a hor horrible uh, family tragedy there. And so so um, in order to force all these individuals together at the assembly line and, and so on. So uh, his wife, he, he resisted the unions, you know, there was a collective, because the, the Ford Motor Company, I did it, I built it. 
it's mine, it's mine, the unions want to take that away from me, and so on. So General Motors had the unions already, and he still resisted it, you know. And he had, this, he had a super thug there who did all the beating. He had his own police in his in his plants there in Dearborn and so. So, um, so it, it was. As he said in the end when he broke down and he allowed the unions anyway. The federal government wouldn't deal with him anymore, and the federal government gave him all these tank things. You know, he had to build tanks and the bomber, the, the liberator, he built and. If he would not have accepted the unions, they would have won the, the contracts, the government contracts, and that would make him bankrupt. So, so but he said it was not that was his wife. So his wife said he had to admit the uh, the unions, and so he he finally did. But I mean, in Ford, you see this in extreme individualism. In a strange way, they were friends, Hitler and so on. They both, you know, had this idea of the great man, the great individual who makes history. And Hitler thought he was that great man, you know, in, in politics. And Henry Ford was the great man in economics. And he built a huge type of a complex. When you see that, what this fellow got stamped out of the earth is unbelievable, you know. He had 70,000 people he employed in that one place there. It was unbelievable, mad thing. So, um, but you see, all these were the masses. But on the other hand, these were these useless atoms, but you needed one big atom which would pull them all together and in order to produce something and to get something and so on. That, that was the idea. So fascism is collectivistic to a certain sense, but in a certain sense also the extreme of bourgeois individualism. Only that there are useless atoms and then there are these great atoms which uh, unite them all and uh, make something out of them. You, you have all these COOs and then you put the one ahead of them and this one gives meaning to all of them. He paid nine dollars a day, finally, uh, to his workers, uh, so they were the best paid workers out and, and all this, so on. In the beginning, yes, but we don't have to go into him now, but in order just to see what that means, why Hegel, who tried to reconcile the individual and the community, why this is not acceptable for a society who thinks that really the individual does it, why they call Obama a socialist sometimes has something to do with that. Because when he says, you know, you individuals, you didn't do that, you know, you individual capitalists. You had help, you know. We all did that together and so on. That undermines this individualism as well. Uh, so we wrote this book, these books, we did, I did not write these books. There was a lot of help, doesn't help. And uh, by God's help, we all have, we all got it together, and so on. So, but people were upset when, when Obama said that. So, it's the question, you know, of an antagonism between the individual and the collective, and this, in, this uh, liberalism absolutizes the individual. And so, it is a certain dualism, too. These are two dualistic things. There's this collectivism, there was nothingness over there, and then and there is this great individual on the other side. And the question is, to overcome this dualism and to mediate it with each other and to reconcile. And that reconciliation fills American thinkers somehow with, uh, <coughs> you know, with distrust or whatever, that he may have also have been the father of uh, fascism and so on and so on. We have to look into that too. The, uh, the German um, the National Socialists did not like Hegel. Um, Hitler hated dialectics, which was Hegel's method. Uh, but they did have the war theory. I think Dustin found out about this. They took the war theory from Hegel, and they may have taken more of his theory of the state or whatever. Uh, with Mussolini, it was different. Uh, he had this teacher in Switzerland, what was his name, um, who was Hegelian. And, uh, and Mussolini was a journalist, and he had studied under this Swiss guy. So there were some kind of a connection. But, I mean, we have the Hegelian on the right, we have the Hegelian on the left, we have the Hegelian in the center, and all these Hegelians are also somehow against Hegel. But they're against Hegel, like Marx against him and at the same time learn from him anyway. So one cannot make Hegel responsible for all those people on the right.
right and the center, you know, the left. So, okay, that was one thing. So that means the political sociology and political philosophy uh, has something against Hegel from the standpoint of an atomistic type of a liberalism um, and the fear that Hegel wants to limit the individual freedom and therefore that he is not a supporter of democracy. Now, the second thing is a more difficult one. The, it seems that the American scholarly, I mean there is a huge Hegel society here and I was a member and I uh, you know, separate myself a little bit because they were too right wing and so on, but, and I think I still pay for the whole thing I think. Um, so they, they have that, but when we mean of the scholarly world and the culture as a whole, there is another thing and that you can see here, it is this word spirit. <coughs> we don't know what to do with that word. So on one side there are materialists and they don't know what this should be. And then there are dualists, they don't know exactly what that should be. And so they know that Hegel's philosophy of right, which would be the basis and has been the basis for sociology, that this uh, is somehow um, uh, based on Hegel's logic and that the Hegel's logic is the development of the notion of spirit. Geist is the German word. Geist, spirit. And that therefore they cannot accept it. Now, what is this thing, Geist? First of all, we still use it sometimes. We use it in political speeches where we say, for instance, the spirit of the nation, the spirit of the American nation is healthy or the 60 and 70, they said something, the spirit of the American nation is not healthy, and that's right. But the word spirit was still used, but also in poetry we use it, and so on. But otherwise, it seems to have disappeared. And all attempts to rediscover it, here, this rediscovery of spirit, seem to have failed. There, this was done in the 80s here, and uh, I don't think there was much resonance or an attempt to to continue that, to rescue it, and it hasn't been rescued. So sometimes instead of spirit, they talk about the brain. So I have that online course, and they put the head there with little wheels in it, and that is an image of spirit. Sometimes they think the computer is, is something of a spirit or whatever. The spirit has come down to the brain, the spirit has come down to, to the computer, to the network or whatever. So, but what was it meant? It's a difficult thing because it um, it means practically that we live in a spiritless situation, in a spiritless civilization. But that is a that sounds bad, and that it sounds bad means that we still know a little bit what the spirit is, you know. Or if you would say a spiritless um, family or a spiritless marriage or something like that. So, in that negation, is present still the affirmation of something which is not really, cannot really be grasped. <laughs> the, um, uh, um, Descartes and so on, he thought about two things, they were material things and then there was the soul and the soul was considered to be a thing too. And so but what did Hegel say really? Uh, for Hegel the spirit is an energy <laughs> and it is an energy which is very similar, if not the same, of the energy of love. The energy of love always presupposes opposites which it unites. So spirit is an energy, a force, which brings together antagonisms, things which uh, uh, oppose each other. So, that means we have also brought uh, down, you know, love to sex. That's not what it's meant, but the spirit of marriage is this cohesive energy which keeps two people together. The spirit of a nation is that totality which brings together all these opposite forces, including even the classes or the gender or the generations. All these opposites are brought together by the spirit. So, 
spirit was originally love, and love is the energy which brings together opposite forces. <laughs> so we can add to this too that these opposite forces were not there uh, in the beginning, but that the opposite forces mean a separation of an original union which then separates itself and then is able and strong enough to overcome the separation and to return to itself. So you could say that the whole history of religion is the human struggle to formulate what the absolute is and it took uh, 6,000 years or more until people tried, somehow got comprehended or got a grasp of what that is. So they came to the union, the absolute is one, the oneness of the absolute, and then they didn't know why this, where this duality of all these things are coming from. And so you have the, these Trinitarian attempts in Taoism already then in Hinduism, and there you have the picture, these three gods there, and somehow Pram is that original unity, and in Krishna he goes out of himself, and in Shiva he comes back to himself, but he doesn't make it completely because Shiva is caught up in the plurality of the dying and living and born things again, that means Shiva is the god of death and of life. And so the uh, women, in, in Hindu women, may have a hard time to accept Western birth control because the children come from Shiva. Shiva gives the children and takes away the children, and you cannot interfere with this because you violate the god Shiva, and therefore they take all the children, even if they cannot feed them or don't know their names anymore, they cannot block this work of Shiva. But the important thing is that Shiva is not Brahms will return to himself yet. The Neoplatonists uh, get better there with the idea of the one and the Logos and the Spirit then to return, and then the Church Fathers take that into Christianity, and they take the New Testament as a uh, vis visual representation of who God is. And who is God? God is love. Or God is spirit. So there is the Father, and there is the Son, and there is the Spirit. That means the Father uh, produces, it's a John 1 there, uh, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that means there is a God, and there is a Word, and then there is a spirit in which the God returns to himself. That means the spirit is the real power which brings that what is diffused and antagonistic back to the beginning, to the one. So this is how slowly the, the uh, history of religion is the history of human reason. How human reason slowly rises to the idea of the spirit. And Hegel's logic uh, goes through that whole process, how the human species got to that notion of love or the love spirit, either in the history of philosophy or in his logic. In his logic is the history of philosophy, but he leaves all the philosophers out. So he talks about becoming and he means Heraclitus, but he doesn't talk about Heraclitus. He talks about being, that comes from Parmenides, but he doesn't talk about Parmenides. That he talks in the history of philosophy. Or he talks about nothing, but he doesn't talk about Buddha, and so on. So he sees how the different notions now in themselves split up, separate themselves from themselves, and overcome themselves. So being and nothing are really the same, they split up, there is an antagonism between the two, and in becoming the two are coming together. Because that, so that is the first form of the Holy Spirit in the very beginning of the logic, becoming. Because coming is that force which holds being and nothing together. People go to bed with each other, produce an embryo, something becomes there, and then they abort it, and it disappears again. That is the process of becoming. Putting into being, 
and then annihilating it, getting it into nothing. And this process and the totality of this process is becoming. And that is how it goes through the whole logic. He leaves all the philosophers out, but he lets every notion differentiate itself in itself, and this differentiation drives over to the next one and the next one and so on. And the highest notion then is the notion of love or spirit. That got lost in the American civilization. It is the first civilization without a metaphysics. And how much that has to do that it is a society without love and our spirit, how much that has to do now with us killing. The girl has been killed in New York again. She just was in the inaugural uh, celebration, celebrated there 15 years old, goes to New York, went into a little place where in order to be protected from that rain. It was just yesterday, and somebody drives by and shoots at death. 15 years old and so on. So one thing after the other in another school again yesterday and so on. So that means when we say that it is spiritless, we mean that because of this atomization, it is not possible for us to conceive of a totality, a power, which brings things together. Like Nicolaus of Cusa, who was a student of Eckhart, talked about defined God as the coincidencia oppositorum, the coincidencia of the oppo oppositorum. That means the opposites fall together. So finally, after centuries, people became, came to a concept of the absolute, which was not just lonely oneness, but which also differentiates itself, determined itself, but did not get lost in this de self-determination, but brought itself back again. This is the whole struggle of pantheism, theism, and so on and so on. And it's a fierce struggle, and people killed each other over this through the centuries. Okay, so that is what is meant now. For Hegel, for Hegel's philosophy of right, that means what he has to say about the family, civil society, the state, and history, and poverty, and <coughs> personal morality, and so on, that all is based on a logic, which is a whole line of definitions of the absolute. The absolute is being. The absolute is nothing, Buddha. The absolute is becoming. The absolute is something. That's how Adorno wanted to start. And finally, the absolute is the idea. The absolute is love. The absolute is spirit. So that is the foundation, and what Hegel does, he applies this logic to nature and to man, and to man's history, and so on. So in, in the background is this notion of the spirit. And this notion of the spirit cannot be grasped. The behaviorists, for instance, for them, the soul of the spirit is a black box for Skinner. You cannot penetrate into the black box. And then come the cognitivists, Tom Lawson, we had him here in our department, you know. They suddenly say, well, there is something going on in this black, bo black box, you know. So there, there is some thinking going on. But then suddenly they found one black box after the other in the black box. Like the Russians have these little dolls, and they ha you have these <laughs> the big little doll. And then you have a little one, little one, little one, <laughs> a tiny one. I, I brought several home or so. So that means you have one black box in the other black box. <laughs> it gets blacker and blacker. It is just hopeless. So cognitivism, did that read it? And when, when you apply it to religion, you know, it becomes particularly catastrophic. And I, I was always, you know, for Tom Lawson because he had a theory at least. Uh, if it was the wrong one, it's okay <laughs> as long as he had one. But I could never become one, you know, and that was the tragedy with Tom Lawson. I, I supported him all the time, but I could not become a cognitivist because it didn't make any sense. Now, um, the, his teacher, you know, Connie Lowe, who hired me, he was a Hegelian. He still knew, you know, what spirit was, and, and therefore they wanted to have this religion department, you know, which would study those things, and it failed and they became then cognitivists, you know, or historians or something like that. So the tragedy goes really into every little detail of our lives you know, to be spiritless. But we have to get a sharp concept of this. So let's say 
that spirit is a power which unites disunions um, and the, it is not only love is spirit or love and spirit and also freedom is the same type of an energy they are uh, words which are somewhat exchangeable so but we see that this type of a freedom is very different from this atomistic type of a freedom and this at atomistic idea of democracy as a contract of isolated individuals who come to an agreement for each other that they will fulfill their needs uh, or will not get in the way of others fulfilling their needs and so on. So, um, uh, so let's say uh, uh, in terms of freedom. <laughs> freedom uh, uh, has two sick forms, and this is our issue of the pathology of not only of reason, but the pathology of freedom. When pathology of reason is in the realm of intelligence, and the pathology of freedom is in the realm of the will. So one is uh, intellectual, the other one is uh, moral. So, so, so uh, Don Juan or Narcissus. You know, Narcissus is the guy who is not able to get out of himself. I would like if we could get that book by by Freud about Leonardo da Vinci. It's, it's a book about homosexuality. Uh, if we could get that, that would be a good thing there. there was a, my son is a homosexual, and, for, and I love him dearly, and we, he was the one who kept the whole family going, but I don't understand how, how it happened, and he doesn't understand it either. So uh, maybe psychoanalysis has to say something about it, or we could look into it. So, but nevertheless, Narcissus is the guy who cannot go to otherness. So. It is something and the other. There is an opposite. And how these two things get together is one and the other. So, and the Narcissus guy, it's a myth, he looks into the water and he only sees himself all the time. He cannot see others. And <coughs> the question is if homosexuality, for instance, has something to do with being unable to break through to the other. My son did date, you know, girls, but it didn't work out, you know, it always ended up in some shopping match or whatever, so the, it was not possible to go out to the other and to find oneself in the other and therefore return to oneself. That would be Hegel's definition of freedom. <laughs> and uh, there is another counter uh, guy, myth or uh, story, and that's Don Juan there, who does break out to the other. But in that process, by having these girlfriends in Spain and in Italy and hundreds in Germany and so he loses himself. And it is not really that these women do not allow him to return to himself, but that there's something in him which does not allow to return to himself. And so Mozart puts him into hell. <laughs> it's a double hell. It is the hell not to break through to otherness, and it's the hell not to be able to return from the otherness to oneself. So the, uh, uh, the power of love, the power of freedom, the power of spirit is that to uh, oppose oneself in the other and return to oneself. Or if you take John's Gospel, the, uh, in the beginning there was the Word, but the Word was not really the beginning. The Word was with God, and the word God was there already. So there is the God who opposes himself in the Word, creates through the Word nature and man, and at the same time remains one with himself. That means, uh, Horkheimer would say, you know, that the great thing which Hegel did was that he included the negative in the notion not being aware, you know, that uh, Christianity <coughs> means that, that God does separate himself in himself, uh, he, uh, in the Logos, who was always with him, uh, and through the Logos creates the world, and then the incarnation, and he became flesh, and he went into the darkness of the world, the world did not recognize him, the attempt to bring the world back, and when Jesus dies, before he dies, he would say, I promise you the Spirit, the Spirit will come, 
the Spirit will lead you into everything. So it is this separation to the point of uh, crucifixion, the point of the cross, which is the symbol there of Christianity. So that means the ex most extreme <laughs> negativity, the torture instrument of the Romans to keep the slaves down, and so on, that is included in the whole process. That means that love cannot be without pain. That uh, Hegel charges the bourgeois enlightenment, and Hegel is the inventor of the dialectics of enlightenment, he criticizes the bourgeois enlightenment that they preach love without pain. He speaks of the masses of the people, the farmers and so on, who are still closest to the infinite pain of love. That means uh, originally the God who uh, separates himself from it, and that is what the painful thing is, but who has, is at the same time the spirit or freedom or love is the power to conquer this negativity, the negation of the negation. And so the, um, there in this is involved, of course, the theodicy solution. The theodicy solution is that God has always and will always conquer things, no matter how negative they are. And somehow after Hegel, this spirit was demolished. Uh, the, uh, the experience of the negative was so overwhelming, not only Auschwitz and, and so on, but all the other catastrophes before and afterwards, that the that a power which can conquer this negativity, that means a power which can negate this negation, is no longer imaginable. Hegel would say, okay, you negativists, and he anticipated the Frankfurt School in a certain way, um, you uh, you know you enjoy it even to talk about the negative all the time, but you are not really interested to overcome it. You know you wallow around in this negativity, and and people said about Adorno, they live in a beautiful hotel, and then they you know look at the hall and the tower outside, but they feel quite good in the whole process and so. And um, he uh, Hannes speaks about. Uh, uh, um, about Kant and Benjamin, you know, where Benjamin uh, develops a new philosophy of history in which he, uh, Hannes says that he uses magic, <laughs> magic images. My God worked, worked about this all the time. So we, we, that's a special thing we can, if we don't want to uh, lose our, our mind for a moment what we are concentrating on and what somehow is the reason why um, all those people who are in this Hegelian tradition have a hard time to find people who can understand them or want to understand them. One thing is that that this personal or subjective freedom and a democracy and a state of contracts between those atoms is not a sufficient way to understand the whole thing. And the second thing is this concept of the uh, of the spirit or of love or freedom, as it is developed in the whole logic, <coughs> step by step by step, with an iron logic. And uh, so sometimes people say, you know, we know in my, our philosophers say we know we have to study the philosophy of spirit. That, that is the, the whole thing. There is a book by Hegel, the philosophy of the mind. We call it the mind. The German is the philosophy of the spirit. But we had a hard time already to translate that, and so the mind is not exactly what that spirit means there, so and it means more. And also, uh, Searles thinks he can get to the spirit through language, and so on. So, some languages, you know, have words in which opposites are uh, represented. So, Aufheben, for instance, a German word, you know, is means to lift something up, to do something away and to preserve something. Uh, if a language has this speculative or this dialectical thing, then it comes closer to what is called spirit and, and so on. So spirit is that energy which unites what is opposite. But this opposition is not the original thin thing. So there is a unity before the opposites which is then reunited again. That is the concept of spirit. And that is what the American civilization cannot grasp. One thing may be the materialism, you know, and this, uh, when you look at television, 
there is a concentration on property all the time, real estate and whatever. There's a concentration on the body, you know, about food, what we can eat, and then dieting because we eat too much food, and then we get sick, and there's a lot of medicine about it, etc. And it all turns around the social organism. And if you look at the porno too, you also have the human organism all the time, without any love, without any spirit whatsoever. I mean, that is, uh, if you want to know what a spiritless word it is, it's really porno there. So, and it is, it is not, uh, it is the body is separated from anything else, the spirit or soul or whatever religious people once called that something, that something which is the black box for Skinner. You know, it is so. It, it, this something is caused by Hegel, the spirit. <coughs> there is the individual spirit, <coughs> there is the objective spirit, and there is the absolute spirit. The individual spirit includes anthropological level, where man and his body and so on are uh, united, and then there is the phenomenological level and of consciousness, and then there is the psychological level of memory, intelligence, and will, and then it's the objective spirit, which includes then poverty relationships and contractual relationships, and then personal morality, like conscience and well-being, and so on. And then comes the objective spirit, that means the uh, um, family, that's what the sociologists are about, and civil society, and the state and the historical process, and then the absolute spirit is uh, art, and religion and philosophy. And art and religion and philosophy have the same content. <coughs> you may say, for instance, look at, a, at any kind of a movie and let's assume for a moment that it's a work of art. Let's see Law and Order. <coughs> what you see in Law and Order is that they try to catch somebody. These are sex-based crimes, but it doesn't matter if they are sex-based or whatever the basis is, but <coughs> they are crimes and crimes are always a violation of rights <coughs> and each right represents human freedom so uh, the right to own guns if you take that away from people you violate their freedom I have the freedom to carry guns it's guaranteed by a law namely the second amendment the second amendment is a law which defends a right and that right is a freedom and so these people sexually based crimes, they violate the right of somebody. Uh, they kill somebody, they rape somebody, and so on. So um, that, uh, when you look into the religious realm, there's also something like sin. People violate divine law, and uh, they expect punishment uh, because of that or so. so there is the content of, uh, of, of art and religion and also philosophy. Philosophy is concerned with, like, Adorno made a study in Germany about old Nazis and so on, <coughs> and how they deal with their guilt or the Michelings, who are the psychologists in Frankfurt, to uh, <laughs> study the Germans' inability to, to mourn that means to be sad about the horrible crimes, the horrible violation of human rights and human freedoms which they committed by attacking, uh, you know, the Soviet Union and so on. Uh, by the way, it was the 70th year of Stalingrad, and um, in German newspapers I found articles about General Friedrich Paulus, who was the commander of the 6th Division, of the 6th, not Division, 6th Army, which consists of many divisions, <coughs> the 6th <coughs> Army of 300,000 men who were supposed to defend the state. And we can take that maybe as our contemporary issue. So, but now, this, you see, that, that it takes us such an effort, you know, to see what is really 
belongs to this differentiation. Only through this differentiation all the pain is possible. But spirit is that power to conquer that negativity. That is the issue. That is what spirit is. That is what love is. That is what freedom means. And this is what we cannot grasp somehow. Uh, that means we understand uh, freedom, uh, that we can do what we want to, but um, the freedom but which does not really go to the other. The other appears as a limit. So um, I can do what I want to, but I shouldn't hurt anybody. That is a negative thing. I shouldn't hurt anybody. The real freedom would be that I really go out to the other. The other is not only a limit. The other is the necessary medium through which I return to myself. I cannot even be free without the other. See, Henry Ford was that individual who could not even recognize that he didn't do what he did. That his workers produced that. His workers built up that. The investors gave him money. The government uh, secured the streets and the roads and the rights and so on and so on. So that means this type of, uh, of an individual type of freedom, uh, that is what, uh, you know, what stands in the way, I think, why this concept of freedom cannot be uh, uh, understood. So my students always understand the freedom of choice. You understand that you go in a store and we want to have that freedom. We want to have little toilet paper, whatever, this car, that car, and so on. The more different commodities you have, the greater is our freedom, and so on. So that's the one which we understand. That is this individualistic type of freedom. What we don't understand is that if you have, do not have this other freedom of being, freedom of being and freedom of choice. These are the two types of freedom. What we understand is the freedom of choice. And we have all these varieties of commodities and that's what we are proud of. It drives us nuts and so on. What is missing is the freedom of being. <laughs> and the f opposite of this freedom of being is alienation. So every al alienation is a lack of spirit and is a lack of freedom. So if I am alienated from the other gender, and that means I cannot move toward the other gender and cannot return to myself in the other gender, I'm unable to love the others in their otherness, then um, something is not entirely healthy or whatever. So alienation, you could say, the more alienation there is, the less spirit there is. To say that a nation or a civilization is spiritless means that it has innumerable forms of alienation. Alienation from nature, <coughs> alienation from the sex partner, uh, the alienation uh, from, uh, from between the classes, you know. I mean, um, Eckhart, you know, said already there this master and the servant <coughs> can never love each other <coughs> because in order to love each other you must be equal and only when you are equal then love, that means that power to unite can come. But if you uh, are, have this oppressive feeling between the genders and one wants to dominate the other or whatever, love dies. That means the, uh, uh, the disunion takes over. Disunion, alienation is the opposite of spirit. A spirit is the energy which unites what is separated. And what is separated was once one but it differentiated itself and this differentiation has to be conquered again. That is spirit. And this spirit appears then on the theological level, but it appears on the state level, it appears on the social level, it appears in the family, in friendships, in neighborhood and so on. So that our neighborhoods, you know, that we don't know who the others are or what they are doing and he has added, my neighbor has added a nice little house to his house <clears throat> but he wouldn't come to me and I wouldn't come to him and we wouldn't talk. I don't even know his name. Or he doesn't know my name and so on. So <clears throat> many neighborhoods are that way and, and they are when you go to the lake, they don't even have any neighbors. You know, one guy sits there, the other one guy sits there, don't even know who's the next guy and so on. But also in the skyscrapers, you know, that we have one here, but in New York or so, they don't even know when somebody dies on the floor below them and so on. So that is this atomization. And we 
they're used to it. They're going up to so what? So what? And, you know, so okay, I mean <coughs> but what we want to make clear is, you know, who we are and our discourse brings us also into self knowledge, you know, what our situation is. And uh, we don't want to say even, you know, that one is right and the other one is wrong or whatever. <coughs> the, um, um, but also with our love affairs, you know, romantic love or whatever, um, the um, discussion, you know, what the Pope has to say and what the Christian Theater has to say and what we say, you know, is uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings all the time. And these misunderstandings have something to do with that there are some people who hold on to this idea of the spirit of this energy which conquers opposites and others uh, think they are really no opposite you know there's you know subjective freedom or their freedom democracy democracy freedom and so on. and I think that the whole struggle which we have in Egypt and so on has something to do with that you know that those democracy people who have studied in Hamburg or here in Boston or whatever, and the Islamic uh, um, Brotherhood, you know. The Islamic Brotherhood knows something about solidarity. Um, you can see that what makes them so popular is that they have this solidarity. That means that they are not only political, that they are not only military, that they are social, and that they give something to Hezbollah, and Hezbollah gives it to the people who have been shot at by the Israelis and the same thing in the Gaza and, and, and so on. So um, it is that what wins over there. And the whole turmoil in Egypt is just horrifying. There, the, uh, the, uh, it, it looks as if the whole state organization is collapsing over this uh, split. And I think it is the split between the Brotherhood, which is in power now, and the democracy people who wanted to have something else. And in the background stands the military, which in four, five, six days will take over if the Brotherhood government cannot establish law and order, etc. And, and then we are back again to the military government, etc. And, and I saw a whole movie today about things in, uh, in Syria, and one dead person after the other, all bound and then shot in the head, you know, all one guy after the other laying there, subsided forever, etc. Nobody taking care of them, and, and, and so on. So, <laughs> I think it is a <coughs> it is a struggle, you know, of a great civilization, which has this solidarity, and uh, opposes these uh, invading forces of an irresponsible type of individualism, me, 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 and in land there, and so on. But also separation of church and state, and many other things which which hang together with this. Okay, now, do we have a, a clear uh, a, a notion of what that spirit thing means? We can leave it alone, but I think uh, it has something to do why it's so hard to build the bridge, but it has also something to do why we don't understand what pathologies are, the pathology of reason or the pathology of uh, subjective freedom, you know. Um, when the French Revolution and ours hangs together here, same spirit, same class, and so on, when they made their revolution, they uh, uh, produced antagonisms which they are not able to overcome. That is the problem uh, which we face. And uh, I think it goes into economic and political and all these things. So, uh, so let's have that, keep that in the, the background there, what the spirit means, and then we, we can come back to this. But there have been attempts, uh, like uh, Searles, and it didn't work. We, um, we cannot get a clear concept of what consciousness is. Uh, we don't get a kind of what self-consciousness is, which uh, came about about 200,000 years ago. Uh, we, unlike the chimpanzees, were able to recognize ourselves in the mirror and so on. And uh, you could say spirit is this union of consciousness and self-consciousness. Right? So that means our consciousness goes out to the other and thereby we become aware of ourselves. It is always this cycle which constitutes the spirit. 
exodus and reditus, going outside and inside. The spirit is uh, violated when you cannot go out. The spirit is violated when you cannot return. It is this dynamic flow between me and otherness which constitutes the spirit. A great spirit is somebody who can go out far without losing himself. It is this tension, you know, which can go to crucifixion, which can be uh, painful. What is painful is the opposite, and then to overcome that opposite. Okay, any uh, comments? What, uh, does it make somewhat clear there what, what we mean, or what does your consciousness say to this? Did Marx translate that into anything? Or did he leave that behind completely? Well, I mean, uh, Marx is concerned with an antagonism, right, between the bourgeoisie and the uh, and the uh, um, proletariat, and before, of course, the patricians, you know, and the uh, plebeians. So he sees in all these societies, he sees that antagonism. And um, uh, and uh, the end thing, the utopia, uh, the classless society, is an attempt, you know, or is is a description of the human species, the spirit of the whole species conquering its inner class antagonism. So there was an original communism in which this differentiation had not yet taken place. <coughs> <coughs> the hunters and the, uh, the uh, hunters and the, the food gatherers and the fishermen and so on, and they had no private property yet. Private property is 10,000 years old. So before there was no private property, there were also no just wars, because all these just wars are wars about thievery, including Hitler's attack, you know, of Russia and so on. They wanted to steal their labor and their territory and so on. So or we in, in Vietnam we want to have the rubber and in El Salvador we want to have the coffee and in Iraq we want to have the oil and, and in Libya and so on. So um, uh, so this uh, the, the scheme you know the evolutionary scheme the human history and uh, history of uh, human natural history uh, which is not yet a real history and then the real history which he thinks would start when people get it together. So if you see the whole species. Uh, moving on, the species moves from one antagonism to the other, and in a maturity stage, until it will reach, which it has never reached, and did not reach the Soviet Union or China or whatever, um, where all class antagonism will be overcome, and where then people will be free, because freedom means that this antagonism is overcome. And it is also uh, love. There cannot be any love between the master and the servant. So, um, and they, uh, there can be no freedom, no, and, and no spirit neither. So, Marx would find spirit and love and solidarity and so on in that goal of the historical process. So, in that sense, he is dialectical. Right? The dialectic in the sense that in union. We were united, but in a primitive way, and then comes come these splits with the city states and so on, and the class differentiation and class antagonism, and it reaches its peak in that what he observes the depressions, because Marx also observed the first depression and so on, where this, the antagonism, uh, you know, reaches its climax and so on, and but then the uh, finally there will this antagonism will be overcome and there will be no new one. That means there will be the class of society, the realm of, it is in the third volume of the Capital, page 800 something, um, where he talks about the uh, uh, realm of freedom on the basis of the realm of necessity. So there will always be a realm of necessity. We will always have to have the metabolism with nature. But this metabolism of nature can be uh, can be rational, uh, can be a rational one, not a wasteful one, and so on. Uh, there can be a union with nature. Um, I got that from the mystics. You know, the humanization of nature and the naturalization of man, and where that happens is in the genders, in marriage, and so on, where the the most 
most wonderful place, and I write some word to somebody against, you know, critique of the church. Uh, you know, how can you let people uh, uh, live in celibacy and think that they can have this uh, reconciliation with nature, you know, because marriage and the gender relationship is the place where that is immediately experienced, which is naturalization of uh, man and the humanization of nature. And porno is, of course, the naturalization of man, but, but without the humanization of nature, and then um, the desublimation of nature and of sex, and it would be good if we were in a free society. But porno, it happens under the control of the ruling class, of the capitalism. It's a tremendous business, you know, porno, almost as good as drugs and weapons and so on. So, and that gives it a completely different exploitative type of uh, <coughs> note. So, um, so Marx uh, is, dialect, is a dialectician. He starts with the union, with the differentiation of this union and its particularization and its opposites and its suffering, its tragedy and so on, or comedy sometimes too, and then, but it moves toward a final reunion. Union, disunion, reunion. And that is the utopia, which of course, utopia means it has no place. Um, when we call Russia communistic or China, they are not communistic. They are socialists who want to move to communism. Uh, that is always overlooked, uh, you know, everywhere in Cuba. These are all not communist societies. If you want to call them communists, then you could say these are socialists who want to go to communism. And you can say about the Labour Party, these are socialists who do not want to go to communism. So the Labour Party would say, okay, we mitigate that class difference. By increasing the technology, we can give every, uh, every worker a house and every worker a car, and when, when he has a good income and so on, it would be fine, and it will not matter if there's a capitalist sitting on top of him or not. Or so so uh, the, that is social demo democracy in Denmark and Belgium, everywhere. And they differentiate themselves from those who are called communists. And they are guys who <coughs> think that this class antagonism has to be overcome, and it cannot be overcome by technology. But the ultimate thing is that it is a union of the human species, the workers of the world, unite yourself, right? It's a, a most perfect union in which no class antagonism happens anymore, in which we don't have the private appropriation of collective labor, which we have here, non-workers appropriate the surplus labor, of the workers. That means surplus labor goes beyond the labor necessary to fulfill their needs. And this tremendous accumulation of billions and billions of dollars of the few individuals, that's individualism, uh, who appropriate all that and leave the others in a precarious type of situation. So that is to be overcome totally. So uh, that that is what it means to be dialectical, right? And uh, the uh, but it is sober in that sense, you know, that the, um, the, there is a necessity of nature and economics which cannot be removed. But beyond that, that is the realm of freedom. And that is the realm where all human forces, eyes, ears, touch, and so on, can completely be developed and are not crippled any longer and in which man is his self-purpose, and in which man can come to himself, in which the conditions are produced, in which he can come to himself, and is no longer alienated. In terms of the economic alienation, religious alienation, sexual alienation, and so on, that these forms of alienation can be overcome. So, simply the removal of private property would only be a beginning of the whole thing. So, it is just one stage. Um, Marx knew of a stage where the workers were nothing else than envious. They just wanted to pick uh, the big houses in West Point or whatever, or what, what is in Chicago, in Detroit, there was this area with the big Point? houses, huh? Grove Point? Gross Point, Gross Point, not West Point, Gross Point. Uh, <coughs> there were the big houses, are all the bourgeois women who never had to work and therefore, you know, have tender hands and all this. So the worker just wants to have the same what the capitalist wants and so on. So that means the worker also has to mature first, he has to become responsible, he must learn to govern and so on. So that happens in this process of socialization.
transition of socialism and so on, step by step, and only then the state can wither away. <laughs> that means the state as a tool by which the ruling class keeps the ruled under control, including, you know, presidents and senators with nice faces and are popular and so on and so forth. They have to do the job then and use that tool in such a way that people do not rise if they have risen in Mariam or in the, you know in Syria or wherever in Yemen. Not yet they're under Saudi control, and, uh, but then people go to the streets and, and rebel and burn down things and whatever. So, <coughs> according to the same principle in my prison camp in Norfolk. Uh, it was a German administration there in the prison camp, a huge guy, Latvian, who could beat everybody over the head. Uh, he was in charge, and he ruled in the name of the American administration, which was sitting outside in the German concentration camp, where the same way they had a Jewish council inside of the concentration camp, who did the job for the uh, German administration outside. So <coughs> it uh, hides from people, you know, the, the real conditions. Okay, is that concept of the democracy, you know, and person freedom, and because that leads us, you know, to what we are concerned with pathology. It is, it's really the pathology of the human spirit, and um, if we don't have a concept of the spirit, we don't know really what is sick. In the movie we saw, you know, there is a physical pathology. Pathology means to talk about pathos, about pain, about suffering, talk about suffering. But uh, the movie shows us physical suffering. People have diabetes and so on. But there is another suffering, which we just described, the suffering of the spirit. But if we have no concept of the spirit, then we don't know what we are talking about. So, Narcissus is sick. Don Juan is sick. Who would be healthy? <coughs> healthy is the one who can freely go out and in the other find himself and return. And to whatever negativity is in there can conquer it. So the formula of the spirit is the negation of the negation as affirmation. When Adorno and I think Conathan and so on, when they talk about negative dialectics, they mean the following thing. They mean that what has happened really in their lifetime what has happened was that the negative had been negated. Fascism was not overthrown by a workers' revolution as they hoped would happen, as Marx would hope to happen, but it was overthrown by an alliance, an unbelievably contradictory alliance of a capitalistic countries on one side and one socialistic country on the other side. And so the negative fascism was negated but out of this negation of the negation did not come an affirmation. What came instead was the restoration, the restoration of Adenauer in Germany, the restoration of the Japanese society. That means the same civil society was restored out of which fascism had developed in the first place. That was the disappointment, you see. Because what was supposed to happen was that in 1918, after this horrible catastrophe of capitalism, people would have found a new way of reproducing themselves. <coughs> and then 1945, there was another chance, you know, to finally do away with capitalism, without which these wars would not have been possible. And it was missed again and again. That means the negation of the negation did not lead to an affirmative society because the moment in which that could have been done, 1917 and 18, and 1945, the moment was missed. Right. So, if you want to bring it on a formula, there you could say the uh, if you take the Hindu Trinity or the Christian Trinity, the Father negates himself. In the Son, the Son is a negation of the Father, and the Son is negated by the Holy Spirit. And it is then in Judaism and Islam where this negation, which is always determination and means finitude, is rejected. That means in the name of the builder for the prohibition of the images and the notion and so on, um, 
Judaism and Islam wants to keep pure unity because as soon as you say in the beginning there was the word and the word was with God and the was word and so on, you introduce the element of differentiation and that means of negation and determination into the absolute and it looks as if you make the absolute finite and that is the definition of idolatry so therefore you know the Jewish attack against Christianity can in the extreme and, and the Islamic attack can in extreme charge the Christians with idolatry with making something finite, infinite but what the Christians say is that the infinite made itself finite by creation, made itself finite by incarnation, and at the same time returned out of this self-alienation, and this return is what is called the Holy Spirit. In Hegel's phenomenology of the mind or spirit, in the end you have the absolute spirit, and this is mediated through Golgotha. That means through the whole horrible negativity of nature, and of, uh, of history and of course people after Auschwitz this is simply too much to, too much to take that is where then they say that the Hegelian system has broken down you know. that means it has broken down about over the negation of the negation where is the negation of the negation you know there's all this negativity around. This girl shot again. You know, these 20 children shot again. Next week they will shot somebody, shoot somebody else. And in the end they shoot us and so on. It is the whole dying process, the disappearance process. Your grandparents have disappeared already. Your parents are still there. You will disappear. The children will disappear and so on. This whole negativity, you know, to that this would be, this negativity is to be negated and it leads to a positive result. That is hard to except, and there's Schopenhauer then, right, who, <coughs> the, uh, who simply talks about Hegel as this cursed optimism. The cursed optimism, you know, has something to do with you think that this negativity could be negated. You are nuts. And Hegel would say, you know, uh, I admit this negativity. So for instance, he describes the whole ha horror of, of history, you know, as radically as Schopenhauer does. But then comes this thing that this negativity has always been and will be negated in the spirit. And this negation of the negation, that is where the question mark is. So, but that may not be valid for the whole American civilization because they are not Adornos, really, you know, they are not Schopenhauer's. We are an optimistic nation all the time. So you have to, in your speeches, you know, the president has to be optimistic, upbeat, you know, <coughs> he would get too sad, you know, that wouldn't be good. His, now his numbers are very up, 60% or what are for him, it's a very high number, because he says, yeah, we can do it, we can do it. <laughs> and so, on. so uh, and that's something, something beautiful in a certain sense. I really like the guy, you know. But at the same time, he kills 200 people, 250 people a month in the drones, you know. Yeah. And there's not a word about it. <laughs> it just disappears. So, uh, so uh, there's, uh, you know, that's the other side. And there are people who are protected from these theodicy experiences, <coughs> particularly in the upper classes. The Gautama, the Buddha, the enlightened one, is the best example of it. You know, he was protected. He was in the in the castle of his parents. He was a nobleman, and married, had a child, and so on. It was heavenly. But then, you know, he went downtown one night, and there he saw the dead man and the dying man, and the sick man, and all the sad people around him. And he was so shocked by this the Odyssey experience. Um, so the question is, in order to understand all that, what spirit means really is, how open is one for this the Odyssey experience? You know, uh, what was this guy from Toronto? That Jew, you you mentioned his name. Fackenheim. Fackenheim, yeah. Fackenheim was one of those guys. You know, a Jewish guy. He wrote about Hegel. He was optimistic like Hegel, and then suddenly some day he got hit by Auschwitz. I mean, he wasn't in Auschwitz. 
something hit him uh, where this became clear to him and it changed everything thank you Baum, another Jew who is my friend and who converted to Christianity and so on he was a good friend with Fackenheim but Fackenheim became so unbelievably uh, whatever pulled into that uh, that Auschwitz thing that Gregory could not talk with him anymore they, their friendship was gone and uh, Fackenheim went to Jerusalem he died in Jerusalem you know and he could not see anything wrong about the state of Jews, uh, Israel anymore neither you know um, so and, and uh, on the other hand you have Gregory and I'm not entirely happy with how he sees it you know because he relativizes things in a certain sense or he said we can always make a new new beginning you know but how can you make a new beginning after after Auschwitz you know after you have done this to to people how can you make a new beginning and well he comes up with statements and said oh, all the Jews in Germany have been Hitler's side if he hadn't done that against them you know <coughs> I mean does that really even answer to the whole thing you know but uh, Gregory just, uh, you know, he cannot endure this negativity. With me, he wrote to me, he said, I've lost your address because I have my address book in the restaurant and somebody stole my address book. <laughs> so I wrote back, okay, here's my number. This is a bad word. <laughs> he, I mean, he cannot endure this when somebody says the bad word, you know. We were sitting in... in um, where was in Montreal in the airport, you know, and we discussed St. Augustine because he was a monk once, Gregory, uh, Augustine in Aramites, like Martin Luther. And uh, so I said, look, now uh, Augustine, you know, is very <coughs> strict about the New Testament and um, only a small path leads to the kingdom and there's a big road where the masses go and as the people walk by, they say, see, they are all going the big road, they're <laughs> going down the train. <laughs> He could not stand it, you know, the whole thing. I said, you are so Catholic. Because the Catholic <laughs> Church, you know, uh, argued against the New Testament for Augustine, you know. Because obviously Jesus thought that only a very small group of people will go into heaven and the others will go all to hell, you know. But but the Church it was too bad, it looked too bad. So they, they, they made Augustine into a heretic for a little while, you know, and... Uh, declared himself a dogma against him, a dogma that of the universal will of God to save. So God wants to save everybody. If you are not saved, then it's your fault. You know, you didn't want to be saved. So, okay. So, but that we get a concept of this, right? Because one can see the spirit only dialectically. As the negation of the negation is the affirmation. The affirmation is the Spirit. Jesus promises to send the Spirit. So, the New Testament is a sensuous reflection of what is going on in God. So, it represents God's history, internal history, in a way that little people who are just sensuous can understand it. And that is true for all myth in a certain sense. So, um, you know, Karl Barth thought that he could be the Thomas of Aquinas of the Parsons, and I would say he could have been or should be uh, the Thomas of Aquinas for both of them, you know. Uh, but it is in our civilization, you know, at this moment, you know, 2013, it is so difficult to get your, what do you say, get your mind around this, get your mind around this thing, you know, what, what that spirit thing means what this dialectics is and so we rather you know repress all our antagonisms in the road map you can see I have about 50 or more than 50 of these antagonisms we are not recognizing any of them the positivists ignore all of them not that they don't know about them but they think we cannot resolve them that means this negativity cannot be negated and therefore let's not talk about it but when you are not talking about it you can certainly not negate it. So it is a self-fulfilling prophecy in a certain sense. All these people, the Schopenhaueris too, you know, they are they making out of the world what they see the world to be, and then it looks very bad. And you have that Hitler was a Schopenhauerian. You have that in him as well. 
the, what he saw as a soldier, what he experienced was <coughs> that history is like nature, you know, the struggle between the predator and the prey. And, uh, and God was the God of that history. He loved the predators and he hated the prey. The Germans had lost the First World War. They were the prey because they were weak. They were weak, therefore God did not love them. And then he made the national arisal, nozzle or whatever, national um, revitalization, and then we will win, and then God will love us, and uh, etc. And then in the bunker he said, God wanted it that way. That means you, damn it, Germans, you were too weak again against the Slavic armies, and therefore what you get that you have deserved. So he said to the secretaries, fate, that means providence, that means the Almighty wanted it that way. It was, he was consistent in all of this. But a positivist, extreme type of positivism, you know, that's how the world is, you know. And you cannot expect anything else. You can only make sure that you will not be among the prey, but that you will be your race and your nation and your family, and you will be among the predators and not among the prey. <coughs> and Goebbels and Hitler saw with the German soldiers went on trucks and all went to the west. They wanted to be captured by the British and the Americans and they looked out the window, you know, and saw, look what they are doing. What kind of men are these who leave their women and children to the Soviets? And so, you know, that showed the misery. And so they had no regrets. <coughs> they said, you know, we uh, let you the right way. You were not strong enough. You were too weak, you bastards. Therefore, all what you get now uh, that you deserve, you know. I mean, I come to Frankfurt again in April, it was in November, and so on. Everything is foreign, you know. Seldom do I see somebody who speaks the dialect of my mother or my grandfather still, or is white or whatever, you know. And they had in the Spiegel, they had a thing about the, uh, the misery of the white man. They had some kind of a scandal. Uh, and in the Liberal Party they had a scandal, there was an old politician and there was a young journalist who got on to him in the bar or whatever and he responded, you know, wanted to have sex with her or whatever and then she, I don't know, she said she was raped or whatever but, uh, and, and the whole population, you know, was on her side no matter what, she, they were on her side against this old white man there and uh, the Spiegel said, you know, it's just the end of of the white man. But I'm not so sure if the white man lets it happen so simply or if they will not make a big um, a bang, you know, before they really disappear. And while Hitler comes up again in movies and books and all the time is that this was his message. Uh, we are sitting on this peninsula, the Africans are calling, the Near East are calling, you know, tremendous birth rate and, and so on and so on and we are uh, you know we are going under and and you have to say our ruling class is still white you know it's Swedish it's no it's English it's German and um, they um, you know they want to use all these races uh, for work you know for cheap labor but they don't want to have them in control okay spirit right if that, if we can carry that away, uh, it will disappear from us again, I think. So we have to repeat it the next time, because, so we, we are not malicious or whatever when we say we are spiritless uh, civilization or nation, so it's not a, we are cursing anybody <coughs> or so. And we can see why it has happened and what the roots are and all this, but there is something... Uh, you know, if we say we, we suffer from amnesia, we can't remember, that is something which has something to do with that too. Remembrance, you know, is also a form of going out and coming together with yourself. Um, a genius is a spirit, you know, who can remember very far and anticipate very far ahead and bring that all back and remain himself in this tremendous otherness. One cannot deny, you know, that Hitler uh, was a genius, uh, he won or whatever, but he had an unbelievable memory. That means he could reach out 
to otherness, to Hannibal and Caesar and uh, you know, all these civilizations and also could predict you know, what would happen to England and, uh, and America and Russia and so on and so on. Um, and then he somehow was able you know, to uh, hold that all together in himself. And it's something that Hannibal attacked you know, Rome and so on and so on in this year and they looked up the library and there were the exact numbers it went even down to the to the very detail what had happened, you know. And they said it's a bad omen. You start the war you know, against Russia on the 22nd of. Uh, uh, it was the same same date when Napoleon marched. It's bad. No, no. They said my told Napoleon marched one day earlier, so he knew the uh, the time when he started and the, the numbers of people. Napoleon had 900,000 <coughs> men. He had three three million men, and so on. so all this detail. So. In terms of the individual spirit, you know what that would be in, in the genius, in the Goethe, in the Shakespeare, and so on. The, the spirit becomes visible in a sense, and or Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, and so on. So that's where we see it: spirit on the individual level. And ah, but then there is also the spirit of a family, for instance. You know, the, the family goes to a lot, you know, but it still stays a family. So you have that negation of the negation, you know. A lot of negative shit happened to them, but they were able to conquer that shit. That is this union that makes uh, a spirit. Not that it's harmless, nothing happened or so, but uh, the bad things happened, but they remained one anyway. And that can happen to a nation too, that's expressed sometimes, you know, we always pulled ourselves together again. You know, so sometimes, you know, in little phrases, you can see that. There is some idea still what the spirit of the nation would be, you know, local spirits and so on. So they, 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 we went to the depression and so on and so on, and we got out of it, you know, we conquered it, and, and so there, there is some some of that, you know, still. So we can look for fragments, for fragments of this spirit, you know, also in our news agency and, and so on. Sometimes it surfaces. We take a break. Yeah. Quarter after <coughs> eight. Yeah. Oh my God. Let's take a break. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And look at the cookies. Enjoy them. There. Let me repeat this uh, in terms of the <coughs> civilizing achievements. Um, we look at the books which have come out there, which have been translated, and they, they look very good. Um, and we saw that these books, you know, come from Kant and they come from Hegel. And then we said, what is the barrier in our civilization? And there are two barriers. One is um, the democracy thing. Democracy understood as an atomized project where individuals make a contract with each other and the state is nothing like a night watchman and so on. So that's what you have, the neoliberal position of Omni and so on that was expressed, this uh, contractual idea. So the individual is really important and the state, you know, is somewhat of the French there, the, also the, boss, the the Tea Party project. These are all people who in, uh, emphasize the individual, and the, the individual is really real, all the other things are not really real, uh, and so on. So, um, what we can do now is uh, um, the um, reading there, we, I think we are clear about it. Do you have any comments about the manifest? Manifesto there, or the book? Did you read a few pages? And do you have any questions about these, uh, uh, either the, uh, this or the depth study? If you took one of them, and uh, uh, you know, Harith or Habermas or so, are there any questions about this reading? Is it difficult? Uh, is it not difficult? Or if it is difficult, why do you think it's difficult? Um, so we will always we can uh, come you know start out here with uh, if you found something words you know <coughs> which sound strange and just say what does this word mean you know then we can discuss it here a little bit. Are there any words which came up uh, or sentences or names of people which we can explain a little bit? Well, yeah. it's kind of overwhelming. You have you have one of those values. You have another one, right? Okay. Don't, 
Justin, you have one too, right? I've got all three of them. Oh, you've got all three of them? Yeah. Oh. They've yeah. got your copies. I've got my copy of them. Oh, okay. So we have three copies. Do you all three have them or no? You have You have the other one. Why didn't we give you the third one? Who has the Alex, third one? Oh, Alex is not here today. Oh. Okay, yeah, so Alex has it. Okay. Well, is there anything when you look at this thing there? Do you know what the picture means there? The same picture which is on the wall over there. Uh, right, so little things which you see, you know, if you name, uh, you know, our president there, Dieter Hennecke, was <laughs> mentioned there. So when there's any strange name or whatever, you can just ask and we can pick it up, right? Do you all know what this picture means in the beginning there? Okay, so this is a chessboard, right? <laughs> and uh, in this chessboard you see kings and popes and whatever, and they're moved around. And then there's a little guy hanging above it. He has a Turkish attire from Turkey, and um, he has a water pipe in his mouth, too. And he is making history there. He pushes those little figures back and forth. And then he hangs on strings, and the strings go up where you cannot see anything. But the guy who is hidden up there is a little hunchback. And um, the picture comes from a man who was called Franz von Bader. Franz von Bader lived at the same time when Hegel lived. They were friends. He was a Catholic, and um, he uh, studied mysticism. So mystics, uh, particularly Master Eckhart and so on, at that time. And he visited Hegel one night, and... Uh, <laughs> showed him Master Eckhart and he read it through the night and he said that is what we always want or that is what we want that is what we want and Bader thought that um, you know Hegel had never read Eckhart but he had read Eckhart in Bern already where he was a house teacher so he knew uh, Eckhart already so now um, there is uh, a critical theorist Löwenthal who is one of the Frankfurt School people who wrote about her. He wrote his dissertation about Bader, and he called him a religious sociologist of sociology, religious sociologist of sociology, and so on. So that's a very interesting type of a guy, and this is where Walter Benjamin got it from. Walter Benjamin also wrote about Bader. Bader was a romantic, and uh, there were things in romanticism which the Frankfurt School people liked. So. <laughs> and they like this Sparta <coughs> fellow. So now the um, Benjamin. Benjamin was one of the members of the old Frankfurt School. He was a friend of uh, uh, Adorno. And he was on a continuum between two extremes. On one side, there was um, Sholem, not Shalom, Sholem, uh, Sholem, and Sholem came from Berlin. And he was a student of Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah. And on the other side, Benjamin had a friend, and that was uh, the... Um, Brecht. Brecht, yeah. By the way, one of my students in political science uh, just wrote a dissertation on Brecht, a very good one. Now he went to Germany with his girlfriend, and he wants to have a habilitation <laughs> in Munich. Can you imagine? <laughs> he will go through a habilitation Double in Munich. Punishment. Yeah, I mean, we have fantastic type of students here. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, like right? Second dissertation. <laughs> in, in Germany, in order to teach in the university, you have to have a doctorate and then a second dissertation, which is called habilitation. <laughs> and he wants to do that. Boy, he is a uh, fantastic type of guy. He was just in Finland. He's just going all over the place. And now he's sitting in Germany, just followed his girlfriend. So, uh, and now he starts the <laughs> habilitation there. Okay, well, nevertheless, so Benjamin tried to get these two sides together, these two extremes. So, on one side, a very religious person, uh, Sholem, on the other side, a very secular person, and of course, he got it from both sides. So, on one side, uh, Brecht said, get rid of those damned Judaisms, <laughs> and on the other hand, they said, well, uh, Sholem said, don't talk with those Bolshevists over there, and so so. Sholem also visited New York and uh, Tillich, Paul Tillich invited him. Tillich was a very, he had a spirit, that means he could get opposites together. And uh, so, but uh, Sholem did not want to give a speech in the Institute. The Frankfurt Institute had moved to Columbia University <coughs> and he said, I will not.
not talk to them. They all damn it Bolshevists. I will not talk to these Bolshevists. <laughs> but he was very friendly. He wanted Shalem wanted to Benjamin to go to Jerusalem. But when Benjamin said, you know, no Jerusalem, then Shalem worked for him in New York that they would take him in there and would let him come over and rescue him. So, and they were sitting in restaurants and bars and Horkheimer didn't want to talk to Sholem at all, but Adorno was also very friendly to him and Adorno worked later on and they printed his letters and, and so on. So, well, that is where this picture comes from. Where the picture is the first thesis of um, Benjamin's book on the notion of history. That means it was Benjamin's um, uh, philosophy of history. And in that book there, the pathology of uh, freedom there, um, he, he compares, Honnett compares Benjamin with, uh, with Kant because they had some similarities. So, nevertheless, the, um, this thing, these, these 18 theses or so, um, one doesn't know exactly where it uh, went to in the end. Um, the Benjamin had given uh, all his books uh, to the library uh, in, in Paris where there was a guy who is the father of deconstructionism, a porno guy, what, what's his name? But ba 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 Blaine, 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 Blaine. Baudelaire? Bo not Baudelaire, no, that was a poem, poet, but uh, he wrote the eye and, and so on. I mean, things where it's very hard to make a difference between um, porno and and, uh, and art. It will come back oh. to me. Uh, um, so, but this guy, nevertheless, he protected all the books from the Gestapo. He was hiding them in the uh, in the National uh, Library in, in Paris and so on. So, and so he the, the had uh, Benjamin committed suicide and uh, before he did that he had a briefcase and some people think these theses were in that briefcase. Some people think uh, the porno uh, literature which he wrote about was in the briefcase. They did not know exactly, but the uh, the theses somehow were rescued, uh, and, and uh, that is where this picture comes from. And the interpretation which Benjamin gave was that that the hunchback on top there, which is not visible, that is theology. It has become small and ugly, he said, and cannot let itself be seen in public anymore. But then the Turkish guy in the attire, that was historical materialism, that was Marxism. And he, in this image he wanted to make clear that Marxism could be legitimated metaphysically and so on by theology. And I added usually that theology could also find historical materialism to be helpful in making history on the side of the poor rather than on the rich and, and so on. So that is what the, what the picture is all about. And it was painted as a collage. It was done by a Jewish student of mine who uh, professor, she became a professor of art. She was schizophrenic, was psychologically ill, and she came to Dubrovnik several times and she was <coughs> enthusiastic about the spirit of our group and out of gratitude she painted that picture and had to ask her for permission and she gave us the permission. It is called the machine, I think, and inside you can see it. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, th that is the origin of the whole thing. <laughs> so, also, you know, every word of the title you can ask if we, to explain this, you know, we, we can do that whenever we come together and you have read a little bit um, you said overwhelming. Why do you think it's overwhelming? It's so big. Well, not just. I mean, just yeah. the whole course, kind of, because it's such this. Yeah. It's a meeting of so many different kind of influences. Yeah, right. So yeah, that's, that's true. Coming at it from like my my one perspective, I've yeah. been very oblivious to things like religion and, and politics and right. things like that. Not that they're necessarily the the main yeah. theme, but everything yeah. kind of plays a part. Yeah, of right. It, so. so I mean, that is the whole critical theory of uh, society. You know, it has a psychoanalytical level, there was a psychoanalytical institute in Frankfurt, and then it has a sociological level, 
um, and that was this uh, Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, and uh, they worked together, and then both were killed off by Hitler when Hitler came into power, and they both were rebuilt after the war, and the Michelich were these two psychologists who work in that institute now, and uh, so, so you have, you know, psychology and sociology together, because there are individual there are no individuals without society and there are no societies without individuals. So we abstract, you know, we abstract from society when we do psychology, we abstract from the individual when he took to society. But these are abstractions, you know. And uh, from a Hegelian point of view, these abstractions have to be overcome because only concrete thinking is real and truthful thinking. And uh, very often we are caught up in these abstractions, you know. Even think where we got concrete, we think porno is concrete because it's eating a lot of flesh or whatever. But in reality, uh, prostitution is a very abstract type of a thing because she only wants to have his money, she, he wants to have her sex. That means they abstract from everything what they are except those two elements. But if they would talk together and she would say, look, I have to do that, we don't defeat my mother or send my sister to college or whatever, then she would become more concrete. Concrete means conquesto in Latin. It means to grow together things. Very different things are growing together, and then you get a full picture, not only an <coughs> abstract one. And uh, so if uh, also he would say, you know, my marriage doesn't work out, you know, I'm lonely, uh, and so and so, then he would become more visible. And so they would become concrete for each other, and, uh, you know, they would grow out of that prostitution uh, commodity type of a relationship uh, to each other. So that's what <coughs> concrete means. And in the Nazi period, you know, the Gestapo would um, count how many times somebody used the word concrete. And uh, if he used it, you know, so many times in a minute, they would say he's a socialist. Because the bourgeois society in which we live is very abstract. And therefore, I think maybe another reason why we don't know what the spirit is, because the spirit means the union of opposites. But this bourgeois society abstracts the opposites. And uh, therefore, when somebody said, you know, I, I'm concretely I mean, and suddenly, aha, that is a socialist because he wants to have a society where things are concrete. And that is the class of society, you know, where the means where the classes have been unified, where the opposites have been unified. So that was a Gestapo trick. <coughs> okay. Good. Okay, so any other good just think what whatever you read, you know, and don't be overwhelmed by it, right? Um do as much as you can. And whatever little word you find, just write it down. Or picture you see or name you hear from a scholar or whatever, just write it down and then we will put it into a context and get it together, okay? We'll put the movie in? Yeah, right. Okay. Now what was the movie about? I it's mentioned it already. Uh, about pathology of reason and freedom. We add that to it now. And uh, so we it's saw physical, physical pathology, but then we also saw oh, the um, the uh, uh, social pathology or the pathology of reason and freedom. Uh, we see a very atomistic society and because of its atomism uh, it doesn't have health insurance at the time and now we have a little better Obama bought something in. So um, that means uh, why should I pay for other people's cancer? Why should I pay for other people's heart attack? You know, to have it? Or why should I pay social security? I'm young. You know, I, why should I have Healthcare, I will never get sick, you know. I live forever, eternally, and so on. So it's always I, 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 me, 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 and so on. And all these social arrangements, you know, they seem to be unnecessary and get in the way of one's own individualism. Um, so, but if we would, for instance, privatize Social Security or privatize healthcare and so on, what you would have, you know, in the end, you have, you know, 50 million or 20 million people 65 years old and nobody has cared for it, you know, because they thought they wouldn't get old. Maybe they thought they wouldn't die, or whatever, right? So um, that is the limit where we see the limit of uh, liberalism, of this atomism, 
because of which we cannot imagine, you know, the spirit of a nation where everybody stands for everybody, where everybody cooperates with everybody, and that's why we are doing great things. Henry Ford, you know, did not great things alone. He did great things with his wife and with his son and with his workers who produced his profit and so on. He didn't make himself rich. The workers made himself rich and those who bought the cars and everybody. But he had his share. He had the idea. He was in that garage. He started the first four wheel things and so on. So that is his contribution. It's nothing about his contribution. That's good. But if he thinks he did it alone, that is an abstraction. Rudy? Yeah. Look, you have a friend here. Boy, where? Yes. Oh my god. Oh, you cannot kill this little thing. <laughs> no, it's a stink bug. He'll smell so really? ungodly if you <coughs> smash him. Really? Yeah. Oh. Here, I'll turn the movie on but and. We, we are solidary with this, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Well, I just don't want to get yeah. stunk out. The union in between. All right. No Holocaust. Do you know where we where we stopped the last time? Yeah, it starts right from where we stopped. Okay, very good. So let's do that to our way station. Enjoy the cookies and blood. insurance company which does not want to insure people really. That's the terminology that which wants to have their money but not pay out. Somebody. You deny their care or the, the, you, you make a decision that, that brings money in and you're not just an ethical savings to the company. <laughs> David, can I have this drink there? David. Blue Cross didn't deny the treatment and actually approved for operation. But then they discovered just observe, you know, what is sick in this whole situation. Apparently, it's common. Men, women can get a yeast infection. So, what's prescribed is a yeast infection, cream, general cream, and um, it went away. She later applied for health insurance, and that's what you're supposed to be disclosing. Serious ailments. The yeast infection was independent and it's not a serious ailment. Uh, the precondition has been removed now the by the Obama administration, at least for a few million people. They could have looked at her medical records, they could have talked to her doctor. Because of the undisclosed yeast infection, Blue Cross dropped Tarsha Harris. She thinks she's put this behind her. A lot of people who are sure to about Blue Cross and Blue Sheet. Tell the doctors we're taking the money back, go get the money from Tarsha. The fact of the matter is, it was a yeast infection. That's all it was. I'm still a little bitter because I don't trust insurance companies now. To me, they're, it seems they're always going to be looking for a way out. You know, what happened to helping the person that's sick? You don't make their problems worse. This is Lee Einer. If they weren't able to weed you out in the application process or deny you the care your doctor said you needed, and somehow ended up paying for the operation. They send in Lee, their hitman. His job is to get the company's money back any way he can. The illness has something to do with contradictions, right? On your which are not resolved. The contradiction is that an insurance company should help the insured and they do the opposite.